It's time for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group with certified financial planners Kevin Corhorn, Mike Bernard, and Josh Gregory. Welcome to another episode of the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group, where every week we're helping you take your next wise step in your financial life. My name is Mike Bernard. I am your host. I'm also one of the certified financial planners on the show. With me in the KFG studios, my business partners and fellow CFPs, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. What's the difference between student loan forgiveness and student loan forbearance? Well, they both start with F. They do. If you're Sounds one of right. the 43 million student loan borrowers out there, you need to know the difference. And we're going to help you with that today. We're going to share with you and help you make sense of the relief programs that exist today on this sh- this episode of Wise Money. What, what's the difference between aid and loan? That one has always confused me when it yeah. comes to student loans and financial aid. Oh, uh, gosh. It's going to get... Uh, we, we're You know what? We're not going to go negative today. I'm telling you, we're not. We're going to talk about student loans, and we're going to do it positive, but we're going to help you out. If you have a question for the show, we'd love to hear from you. Auto Owners is once again sponsoring our question segment. We appreciate their support. We'd love to hear from you. You can call us or text us, 574-222-2000. That's 574-222-2000. You can find us online. Submit questions right there as well, wisemoneyshow.com. That's where you find us. Submit questions right there on the right. Most of the questions come on social media. Actually, they come on the YouTube channel. Check it out. Go to YouTube, search Wise Money Show. But then also we're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram to search Wise Money Show and follow us there. Student loan debt in the U.S. is now $1.5 trillion. Trillion, $1.5 trillion. That's a massive amount. It it is second only to housing debt, to mortgages. That's it. I mean, it has surpassed everything else. Josh, you're right. 43 million individuals have student loans. What else can I tell you? The average balance is now $37,000 with a monthly payment of $393 a month. Now, that mortgage or that that balance, that average balance, that's a brand new Tesla. Don't don't buy it. Don't buy it though. It's an Audi, you could buy. It. That's a down payment on an average house. And that monthly payment, I mean, that's a that's more than your car loan payment should be. So, uh, it, it it is a it is a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Now, you throw a little COVID pandemic Sprinkle in a recession, top it all off with unemployment in double digits, and presto, we have a we have a crisis with student loans. So what happens? CARES Act comes out and says, well, we'll solve it. Let's throw some forbearance in there. And then executive order signed by President Donald Trump on August 8th extended that. So and there's more stimulus potentially in the works, depending on when you're listening to this, when you're watching this. I don't know. Maybe there's another one on top of it. But what's it all mean? What's the difference between student loan forgiveness, forbearance, and uh, and, and what do you make of all this? Well, so the CARES Act that you were referencing was actually the second action earlier this year. Uh, a week before the CARES Act came out and created this forbearance um, the the Department of Education or Education Department, I guess it's called, they they actually um, mandated that any student loans, federal student loans that are held by the education department, they had to go to zero percent interest, no payments happening, and they were going to stop, you know, trying to collect on any of those loans that were in in default. That's what the forbearance was. Essentially, it was them recognizing that, hey. We're, uh, there, there are a lot of people that are hurting out there. Let's hit the pause button. It's probably similar if you were ever on a Little League basketball team or something like that, and your team is just getting walloped. What does the coach do? They call a timeout, right? Let's let's make some changes here. Let's let's get some relief. Let's I thought get our you were going to say a mercy in. rule. I, yeah. <laughs> is there such thing let's as Little League home. basketball? <laughs> well, I don't know what they call it. There's upward basketball. Okay, so, so for this is my kids' I, skill level, I wanted to check this out. So if you if you go to the Google, and you define forbearance, um, patient, self control, restraint, and tolerance, uh, I think we could all use a little forbearance in our lives. That's a good good definition. But uh, so so essentially, there is a difference between forbearance and forgiveness, and they do sound similar. 
And if someone's talking really fast, you might confuse one for the other. Mm -hmm. Forbearance is not forgiveness. Your loans are still out there. And this forbearance actually only applies to about 90% of loans in existence, student loan exist in, in existence. And that is, they've got to be Department of Education or Education Department. You know, I think it's Department of Education, but their initials are ED. Yeah. It was strange. Um, and, uh, and so <laughs> just thought I'd bring that up. Solution for that, too. Yep. And so <laughs> if, you, if you have a private student loan, this doesn't help you. It doesn't help you. But essentially, forbearance is, hey, whatever your federal, your Department of Education loan, whatever the interest rate was, it's now zero. And whatever your payment was, it's now suspended. You don't have to make your payment. And that was supposed to expire at the end of September. Yeah, that's the key. This was temporary. Right. Started out as a six-week deal. Then it went to six months. Or sorry, 60 days. And yeah. then went to six months. Now it's been extended through to the end of the year. You know, I wouldn't expect it to just keep on being extended forever, right? Mm -hmm. This is a window of time where you're given some relief, and um, it, it should be automatic if your loans apply. Right. And we can talk later about, well, what happens if your loans don't apply? But you, this is something that you need to have on your radar screen. If forbearance is applying to you, maybe there's some good stuff that could come from it if you're planning ahead. We are going to get into that, but let's talk about a couple other things. And again, I don't know when you're listening to this, but to, to add a little confusion to this forgiveness forbearance discussion, enter the HEROES Act and the HEALS Act. Now, personally, I think the HEROES Act was all about our children's children will be the heroes because that thing was $3 trillion. It was a $3 trillion stimulus plan. And, you know, our kids, kids, kids were going to be paying for that thing. It did not pass in its original form. I have no idea where the discussions stand at the moment. Um, but that had, I believe, a $10,000 forgiveness on student loans. And I believe, folks, I believe, I don't have the gazillion pages in front of me. I believe they were even trying to forgive 10000 of private student loan debt. Um, the HEALS Act... This was the Senate proposal that did not go anywhere. Um, I, I, I don't believe it had a full 10000 of forgiveness, but I believe there was some forgiveness in there as well. So if we do get another stimulus program here to help aid, and again, guys, this is not stimulus. This is just aid. It's just, it's just help. There's no re-stimulating in the economy. It's just trying to help people get through this right now. And... Um, I think it's possible to to either have some forgiveness be part of it or potentially even lengthen this forbearance even longer. Yeah, the confusing thing is forgiveness uh, and what a what a beautiful word forgiveness is and the concept. But the the question is the the if the government says, "Hey, we're going to forgive Mike's student loans." They basically are saying we're taking money from Joshua involuntarily and giving it to Mike. And so the, the, the risk is there's all kinds of moral hazards and other things, but the risk is what it creates is it continues to kind of enforce and reinforce this idea that if I hold out long enough and hope for a bad enough crisis, I will get better bailed out from my bad, pers potentially bad personal decisions. Kevin, did you not hear me when I said we were going to stay pot? We weren't going negative. That's as positive <laughs> as I can get, man. <laughs> when, when we're talking about student loans, that's as good as it gets. All right. We're, we're going to be hitting, I mean, real life implications. I mean, really, if you have loans in forbearance right now, what should you be doing? I've got that next and then also what do you do with these moral hazards so we've got a lot more to hit coming up on the wise money show with corhorn financial group hello youtube audience this is the wise money show you're at the wise money show channel if you're not a subscriber hit that subscribe button turn on notifications as well what you're watching is our one hour weekly talk show that airs every saturday at 10 a.m right here on the Wise Money Show YouTube channel. It also airs at 10 a.m. on podcast as, where, as well, wherever you check that out. It's a full hour, and, uh, and so you'll catch it 
here, as well as all the breaks and everything else, as well as on podcast. It also airs a couple different radio stations in our local community in northern Indiana. So once again, if you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button. Leave questions and comments below. We appreciate it. All right. So have you gotten, have you tried to get your mind around the whole Heroes Act stuff? No. But it, so, I mean, if they're, they're talking about $10,000 of forgiveness. Mm-hmm. So with $10,000 of forgiveness, I, I have an incentive to not pay my loans below 10000 Well, of course. I mean, we're going to talk about that here in just a second. I, you also, um, you know, fairness is not possible, but I didn't take student loans. My brother did. You know, I, I worked, and, and my brother didn't. So he gets ten grand towards college, and I don't. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's real. Yeah. So, I, and I don't know. Have you? And we're going to talk about this on the on the air, not just bonus content. But have you had clients ask you, should I use this five twenty nine money, or should I take a loan instead in case they forgive it? I have had that question posed to me. I have not heard that question. Hmm. What do you What do you do? I I think Kevin should you I mean should you be racking up loans like crazy, right? Well that that is the question and I think what what would I ever I mean here's here's the 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 question that you have to start with. What would I ever borrow money for? Would I borrow money to take the family to Disney? Would I borrow money to and just keep right on going? This has got to come out on the show. Okay. That's, that's good. Let's do it. That's okay. Good. Let's go. Should should you take out student loans with the thought that well, listen, a stimulus is going to take care of it. That they're going to put them in forbearance, so my my interest rate will be zero, free money. I like that. Um, and uh, or it could be forgiven, which is actually free money. But there is no such thing. So what what do you do with this moral hazard? What do you do if you've got a student loan right now and things are in forbearance do you just enjoy that or do you take some action we got that right now this is the wise money show with corhorn financial group my name is mike here with me kevin and josh every episode of the wise money show is on youtube check it out go to youtube search the wise money show subscribe to it turn on notifications you get every episode you get every daily update that uh, that comes and then you get all the bonus content as well and uh, there was just some good bonus content we're going to flush out here on the air. So, okay, guys, I mean, let's talk a little bit about this moral hazard. I mean, what, what do you do? I've actually gotten the question from clients. Hey, been saving up, been saving up, been saving up. It's time. My child's in college. Got this money in the 529. Do I pull the money out or do I actually take a student loan because it's in forbearance and it's a 0% interest and they're probably going to forgive it? <laughs> yeah. what, what, do you, what do you do? Well, that that does create a problem, um, a potential problem, and so Kevin, you've got you know your son mm-hmm. is um, y- your son is a hero serving our country just as you did, and um, but he's also taking a deal, mm-hmm. right? Yep. His service absolutely it, it can exchange for some financial benefits with college. Your middle child mm-hmm. is going to one of the finest universities in the land. <laughs> University of Michigan. <laughs> and I mean, should, so, so Josh is, Joshua has already taken a deal and he's working and sacrificing for that deal. Yep. And, and the, in order to get great candidates for the service, they, ha- the, the social benefits that they, that these guys have and financial benefits are, it's really breathtaking. Like w- when you look at what could you get for three years in the service, um, it is amazing. Like his his everything's going to be taken care of for him as it relates to college. But what? But are we are we that far away from just saying you know it's not a it's not a a, a few years of service that get that exchanges that for you? It's it's a uh, you know U.S. birth certificate that that you you get. But let, or, or so let's talk about let's talk about Caleb. You know, does Caleb? Do we you need to borrow as much money as possible? Because listen, it's really low interest or zero percent, and boy, they're politicking to just forgive all this stuff. Yeah. So um, the nice thing about Josh not needing the money we set aside for him, and the way five twenty nine plans work is that you can move it from child to child, and Caleb 
is on a full tuition scholarship at University of Michigan because he's in the Naval ROTC. So the only thing that he has is room and board to go sit there and stay. Well, now he's got a standing desk. So stand in his room and listen to these professors. And I was talking to my wife about how Caleb could stand at home yeah. uh, <laughs> for a fraction of the price. Um, so there is a question, well, what do you do with the money that you've prepared for this event? Do you hold back on that money and go and get a student loan in order to possibly get it forgiven at some point in time? And that to me, it seems like such, such a stretch because the question is, why would I ever encumber myself why would I ever go into debt? That to me is the is the beginning of the question. And in theory, as you look at going to college, I'm going to college to gain certain skills that I currently don't possess. As I gain those skills, I'll be able to trade those skills for money. So it may make sense to take money that I don't have via loans or whatever else to invest in myself to get skills that I don't have. But I I believe, and, and this is, again, this is just anecdotal evidence, but I do believe that there are people that are saying, wait a minute, I, I'm not going to pay that much money, especially, I'm not going to go to school to, to sit in my dorm room. And a lot of these schools, I mean, Caleb's in his own room. A lot of his friends are in their own rooms. So I'm going to go sit in my own room and have none of the social interaction that you normally think, you know, associated with a college experience. You got a roommate or several roommates or what have you. So this is so this is where you say, what what am I willing to borrow money from? And as we look at places like New York City with the apartments emptying out in New York City and folks going to work from home in a different home in a different city and state it, that may that we may see something like that as it relates to higher education ooh yeah interesting you know i i feel like what you're alluding to is that when when borrowing it should be for an investment, right? The, the, there should be some sort of a gain that will help pay for that debt. And you're, you're describing, hey, new skills that will drive up your earning capacity later on in life. Um, but the same principles apply. You know, if, if you're going to invest with borrowed money, it needs to pay for itself. And the, the risk is, is that when money gets too cheap or too easy, or maybe you even speculate that it could be free, the the rigor that you would um, apply towards evaluating whether that's a good investment. Is it worth the risk? Is it worth the later sacrifice down the road? Um, You know, it stops mattering to you, potentially. Right. So let me jump in there. I said this before we started um, recording that I, when I got my hip injury and I, you know, my body's actually falling apart. You guys don't, yeah, you might've heard a little bit of that, but it's like duct tape and, and <laughs> bubble gum trying to keep me together. And so I had a neighbor kid, good kid, good kid, Lucas, um, who played football in high school, whatever. And so I said, Hey man, can you help cut my grass? I'll give you a couple bucks. And he's like, yeah, I'll do it. And, uh, and I love it. I, I love, I'd, I'd rather pay him than, you know, uh, a, a big company and whatever. And so uh, I asked him this weekend, I said, hey, when does college start? He's a freshman. And he's like, ah, class have already started. I'm like, oh, really? And he's like, yeah, when I found out that, you know, I'm the one paying for it, I'm not going down to Bloomington to stand there and take classes and pay rent. I'll just do that here. So I'm doing the semester here and we'll see what next semester looks like. And it's like, my goodness, way to go, bud. I mean, in this kid, he is sharp. He's really sharp. And Yet, when you realize there is a tangible cost, you might make a different decision. I mean, that's what mm-hmm. that's what I take away. Mm-hmm. And so let's and these are bright young kids. Let's reveal to them what three hundred ninety three dollars feels like yeah. of of student loan debt, or reveal to them the weight that's on their shoulder shoulder and their decisions. Maybe they'll make a great one. And part of making great decisions with your finances is. Um, you almost need to incentivize your kids or teach them how to make good decisions with debt. 
And you would not want your kids' very first borrowing activity to be one where they go into it thinking maybe they're not going to pay anything back because that gets inside a kid's head, Oof. right? Or and, even and grown be, kids too, by the that's way. That's right. Mm-hmm. And before you know it, yeah, they're thinking, oh, these credit cards, uh, do I really have to pay these back? Or that, that car loan? So to me, I would want my kids before they sign on the dotted line and borrow any money, I, I want to look them in the eye and say, listen, you're making a commitment. You're giving your word that you're going to pay this back. Do not expect that someone else is going to do it for you. 100%. I 100% agree. Now, the question still begs, if you currently have student loans, federal student loans that are in forbearance, we've already said Forbearance means 0% interest rate for the time being, and no payment is currently due. So do you just you just uh, hang out? I mean, do you just enjoy that? Or is there something you should be doing in your financial life? And we would tell you there's two things you need to be doing right now if that situation applies to you or your kids or someone you know. We're going to tell you those two things coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. No, I just do what you tell me to do. I don't know, Lindsay. I don't, all I, I just, I don't think, I just talk. (laughs) You're supposed to do all the thinking for me. So should I, like right there? So maybe, oh, this thing is really loosey goosey. So here's, this is, this is the potentially confusing thing here is that, um, is that better? With yeah. with mortgage forbearance, I'm I'm not I'm still incurring interest. But I, they moved your interest rate to zero. With mortgage forbearance? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, this this is what I'm saying. It's different. Right, like right, why is it yeah. different? Yeah. Because with mortgage forbearance, um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. All right, let's get into it. So, so because the the other in in the spirit of bonus content, I was talking to Caleb while he was home, and he said, "Dad, I'm glad I didn't try to go be a SEAL right out of high school because physically, I wasn't developed enough." So he's he's probably he's easily twice as strong as he was, and he can run forever, and he's he's amazing as uh, as this aspiring SEAL. And who knows where he'll end up, but he he still has this dream of being a SEAL. And then I so I look at Caleb and physically Caleb wasn't ready. He he wasn't ready to do what was next at eighteen. Like at eighteen, you need to be ready if you're gonna sign up and go be a SEAL. He wasn't ready. Mentally, my son Joshua wasn't ready. He wasn't ready after going to school for 13 years to sign up for four more years. He needed a break. He needed to hit the pause button. And I, you know, as soon as he went and his first year was in South Korea, and I'm saying, hey, Josh, you know, you got this opportunity to take these classes paid for by the military, and it's a really cool thing. And he he just was disinterested. Mm. And um, it really, it's about... Two years, a little over two years into his three-year commitment where the switch was flipped and he is ready. He is writing essays. I spend my weekends talking through essays with Joshua and Hmm. thinking about things and um, all of this stuff. And he just, so mentally he wasn't ready. And so, but I think about this. And I think financially, like how financially am I, how financially ready am I at 18? Right. And so the, and the problem is, so I think Caleb would have had a bad result if he would have signed up and gone to Ben Seal. I think Josh would have had a bad result if he would have gone to college because he would have been just like every other freshman who goes and his headspace was not there. So he wasn't ready. But I, and then I think financially. And so a lot of people just, 
They're, they're in this line and say, I can't get out of line. I'm just going to keep going. And they go over some sort of financial cliff when financially, if they would consider a different option to allow themselves some sort of uh, preparation and in order to get even even more ready. But I can tell you this, at 18, most kids aren't ready to make a debt decision that will that that will entrap them for they don't fully understand it do they you can't and, and they don't until they're graduating and someone sits down and explains to them okay here's how this is going to work here's when the payments start coming mm-hmm. and and it's like this wake up call and um, no wonder you know the the immediate thinking is okay well is there a way that I can get some relief on this mm-hmm throw in a pandemic and I need to get some relief on this. And I and one day we'll write a book about the idea that if I'm a business and I borrow a bunch of money in really low income and low tax years and have to pay it back in high income and high tax years, it is it it cuts both ways in the wrong direction yeah. mm-hmm. yep. and it feels that way with student loans and and some there's a there's a picture there that that needs to be painted um and i i don't know exactly how to do it but i i wish i could show you what's in my mind's eye that's good stuff all right so let's talk about what to do if you've got federal forbearance federal loans and you've got forbearance going on and then and then let's jump down to the last question of you know how do you how do you make sure this student loan debt crisis doesn't become a crisis for you um, it, which is kind of what we've been talking about the whole time, but let's take we some action steps. We say anything about the forgiveness side. We well, can even listing the I mean, we programs can. or anything. That, yeah, we can. All right. Student loan forbearance introduced. Oh, the week before the CARES Act, the CARES Act lengthened it. Executive orders lengthened it, and now it uh, it's in place for federal loans, federal student loans through the end of this year. What should you be doing if you have federal student loans in forbearance? We're going to talk to you right now, tell you two things you need to be doing. This is the Wise Money Show. My name is Mike Bernard. Here with me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Every episode is of the Wise Money Show is on podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, Spotify or iTunes, wherever you're at. Just search the Wise Money Show and subscribe to it there so you get every episode delivered right to you. And then also rate the show. We appreciate that and gives us feedback. We we would appreciate you doing that for us. All right. If you have federal student loans, they are in forbearance. And the deal, even though the Webster Dictionary uh, definition is a little different, we define it right now, or basically Congress has defined it. Your federal student loan, the interest rate is now zero for this period of time to the end of the year. And your monthly payment is now zero for this period of time. And so what should you be doing? We've got two things. Number one, if this relief was very much needed because your financial life was not stable, you need to use this this newfound freedom and flexibility to stabilize your financial life. Build, Create a moat around your financial castle with this freed up money. Don't have it mean you can you know, you you can watch Mulan for $30 or whatever, right? right? Uh, You know, so you've got a little more (laughs) fun that you can interject. Build build some financial stability. So the way you do that, if we were going to give some specifics, you're you're using these months of reprieve from your student loan payments. And instead of making the loan payment, you pay money into your own emergency fund, maybe. Maybe it, it starts building up some sort of a safety net for you so that if the crisis goes longer than you're ready or there's a, a second round of, of trouble that comes your way, um, you, you need to be ready for it. An, another example might be to knock out some consumer debt that you have. Um, maybe since you don't have to be paying anything right now on your student loan, you can be paying really aggressively on that credit card or that car loan, something that eliminates the high interest debt, which is just bleeding interest on you, but also is representing a monthly obligation that maybe you'd be able to knock out and completely eliminate so that you're you're freeing up cash flow. You're, you're giving yourself more margin in your life. Those were the two that I thought of. And, and there's a third that I'd throw out there. If there's a need, not a want, 
but a need that you know is coming up out there in the future. And, and there's no way around it. You, I, I, I'm, I'm making this move or I've got this expense upcoming and it's not a want that you, that, that you can choose to, to not do. It's a need and you don't have a plan to pay for that. Maybe you use this reprieve to build up and prepare yourself for it. But, but if you've done all those things and you're ready for that expense, you have no consumer debt, your emergency fund is full, now what do you do? That's the second thing. Pay down on your loan. Well, but wait, Mr. Wise Money, I, I don't have to. <laughs> well, you should. Pay down on it. Yeah, yeah, but, but wait, it's at 0%. I know it won't be 0% forever. At some point, that 6% interest is going to flip back on. And do you want the same balance or do you want a lower balance when that 6%? turns back on or five and a half or six and a half have a lower balance pay on it right now if you're in a strong financial situation yeah be animalistic in your approach to reducing and eliminating debt and work from a debt snowball um you certainly your 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 certified financial planner could help you with that but if you don't currently work with a certified financial planner and you can go online and get a debt snowball but i would know a lot of times it sometimes, if you don't like your financial situation, a lot of folks want to stay in denial, and that's not just a river in Egypt. That is that is a state of saying I have no idea what's going on, and that's a that's a happier place than actually knowing and being a leader. A leader's job is to define reality. So I've defined reality about my current financial situation. Now I'm going to outline the steps that I need to take. And one of the steps that you need to take to get yourself into a great position financially is to eliminate debt. Mm-hmm. Because that gives you incredible options. And when you look at people in their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, they have great options. It's because of the hard work and the heavy lifting that they did back in their 20s and 30s yep. to, set the, to set the table for those things. That, that's right. So, um, so don't be confused. Don't be distracted by, well, it's, I don't have to make a payment and it's 0%. And really, really, really don't be distracted by the politicking out there that, well, all the loans are going to be forgiven. Um, I actually worry about, the, I mean, that messes up the financial world. I, it, it would mess up what's between your ears as well. But just the stroke of a pen to forgive some loans, I, that has a financial world implication. And um, I don't even know how that all goes, but I know it, things get messed up. Mm -hmm. And so if Congress does that, there's some other big ramifications. But there are some student loan forgiveness programs out there. And um, the forbearance programs that are in place with the CARES Act, and even, even the Department of Education said that the executive orders apply for this as well. You know, not not making these payments right now isn't going to screw up your current forgiveness program if you're working one. So there's a there's a 10 year uh, teacher forgiveness loan, right? Five years. For, five years. Okay. Yep. Uh, five years. If you're working in certain school systems, mm-hmm. it's got to be serving, you know, um, underserved or lower income kids typically. So y- you would want to check and see if if you're graduating, going into the field of of education. Find out, you know, is the school that I'm going to be landing in, does it qualify me for possibly some some forgiveness? Ten year for a nonprofit, working at a nonprofit, but it can't be a religious organization. I have no idea why. Um, there's also the income-based repayment. That one actually freaks me out because you're, the average student loan payment right now is $393 a month. And that's with a bunch of people on income-based repayment where they're only they're not even paying the interest on their loan, right? So that so you're not even paying the interest, meaning your your loan is growing every single day, and hopefully depending on what your income level is, potentially, yeah. But the the idea there is you you're paying some small minimal amount for ten years, let's say, and then whatever balance is left over theoretically is forgiven and taxable to you under current laws and so so work with your certified financial planner if you've got student loans to have the right posture 
if if your student loans in your situation qualify for one of the current forgiveness programs out there, you need to be aware of that. You need to know what those rules are. You need to know what the do's and don'ts are. Work with your CFP on that. Don't don't just ignore those, but don't rely on some future forgiveness program to bail you out. If you've got debt, if you've made a commitment to borrow money and pay it back in the future, then have an aggressive animalistic stance towards that. And if those loans are currently in forbearance because they're federal federal loans, you, you know, we just talked about those couple things you need to be doing. Building up that emergency fund, paying down other debt, strengthen your financial situation, and once you're strong, continue to pay on that debt. Continue to pay on that debt. Anything else? Anything? Uh, the only warning I would give is, you know, we've seen folks over the years who, because of a personal hardship, not a pandemic or anything, they put their own loans into deferment. And boy, they, they go from deferment to deferment. It's almost a cycle over time because they're not fully dealing with the, the root issue. And, uh, you know, that's how you wake up one day in your 50s and you're still paying on your student loans. Right, right. So, uh, $1.5 trillion of student loans out there. This affects a lot of you. Reach out to your certified financial planner. Make sure you're getting help. Make sure you're getting wise counsel. All right. We've got listener questions from fans of the show. That and more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. All right. Good stuff. All right. So Fourth segment. Yeah, we'll start. Uh, we'll start with that top question there and it's a couple of different questions and one that's the only insurance one that we got so if we want to make Dude, it well i had a I had a great one yesterday um because we were working with some folks and they said hey you know we've worked with our guy at this what we would call a direct writer we've been working with him for a long time so we really want to give him a shot and so we we kind of equipped them to go in and see and their guy did a nice job. Um, the issue is their guy only had the one product from the one company that he could deliver to these folks. And the issue with that one product, because we had said, you, you guys really are way overdue to have an umbrella policy. So they said, okay, well, we'll get an umbrella policy. So when they got the umbrella policy right there, no uninsured, underinsured hmm. motorists. I already know who, what company you're talking about. And actually, I bet I know the company you're thinking about, and it's not that company. No. So um, it's a different one. But a lot of these big, major, nationwide companies are are not going to do that. And when I when I highlighted that, they said, "Well, wait a minute. We talked a lot about uninsured, underinsured. How is that even?" possible and and so this is this is why you know the question is who's looking out for you yeah mm -hmm. and if you're if you're learning how to buy insurance from the insurance sales gal or sales guy you you might not uh have sufficient learning and can you imagine what that industry would be like if you had to be a fiduciary <laughs> as an insurance agent oh dude you gotta bring that up you better bring that up okay yeah if there's no if they're trying to poke them in the eye but it <laughs> it's kind of buyer beware when you're for buying sure. insurance right for absolutely because most people's capacity to understand the complexity like it, it's just it's so baffling mm -hmm. oh my goodness all right I, I, there's another question there as well. So we'll hit both of those. I think I just threw it down there. Thanks for being with us. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. My name is Mike Bernard. Here with me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. And now it's our favorite part of every show, taking questions from fans of the show. If you have a question, 
please connect with us and submit it. We we appreciate it. You can do so online, wisemoneyshow.com. Submit a question right there on the right. All over social media, that's where we get most of our questions, the YouTube channel. And typically what happens, you submit a question there, I'm going to see it and I'm going to get back to you right away, answer your question. And then if it's you know confidential in nature, you need some help, we'd love to help you. If it's a question for the show, I'll put it on the queue and we'll hit it here as well. Um, and then also you can text your question into us, 574-222-2000. That's 574-222-2000. Also want to say thank you to Auto Owners Insurance for sponsoring the Wise Money Show. Uh, every so often they sponsor a special segment and a listener question segment of the show where we kind of pull up the insurance questions that we've collected and hit that. So thank you, Auto Owners, and um, let's get into it. So First question, first question comes in. It's a two-parter. It's a goodie. Is it better to shop separately for the cheapest auto insurance and then the cheapest homeowners insurance? Meaning you look at different companies. Uh, so, and so that's one. And then second, how often should you shop your insurance around? Great question. And it, you know what? Um, we here's our philosophy when it comes to insurance. Part of our financial planning process is to review the coverages that our clients have right now and understand the risks that they're exposed to because we want to make sure that they have the right types of insurance, the right amount, and yes, we want to make sure they're not spending too much on it. A lot of people fear that they've got money slipping through the cracks because they're spending more on insurance premiums than, than is necessary. And you might tell yourself that, okay, the cheapest way to, um, to get my insurance in place is to find the best car insurance or the cheapest car insurance and find the cheapest homeowner's policy. Grab one of each, maybe they're from different companies or whatever, and, and there you go. I've got a great inexpensive policy. I mean, that's how I, that's how I do my cook and my shopping. My, that's how I do my recipe. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't uh, if it's a craft recipe, craft lasagna, no, I'm buying the, uh, the Our Family lasagna noodles. I'm buying the, the cheapo uh, spaghetti sauce, right? I'm going and saying, hey, these are the ingredients. I'll go find the cheapest ones and mix it together. That, that's how I'll cook. Um, that's how you probably do a lot of your, your consuming. Sure. In insurance, that can often be an enormous mistake. Right. Because what you have to recognize is that in the insurance world, when you bundle together insurance uh, like homeowners and automobile and maybe an umbrella policy, if that's appropriate in your situation, you're, you're qualifying yourself most often for some discounts. It's actually cheaper to get um, these coverages put together with the same company. It also, I, I would argue, is a better way to do it because you're making sure that one company has their eye on uh, where one policy ends and the other one begins and that they're all coordinated and working well together. These are like puzzle pieces that should fit well together. You might not be able to, to get that just right if you're piecing together uh, policies from different insurance companies. You know, the one that, that sort of freaks me out is, um, you know, you, you insure your house for a whole bunch of reasons. But if you just think of, like, what are the two big risks? I think of tornado and I think of fire. And um, what is in my house that would also be damaged if a tornado ripped it apart or I had a fire? my vehicles. Right. And so how do I get, I wonder, you know, if you, if, if you have those in separate insurance companies, those insurance companies might fight a little bit. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there, there's a fancy term that hopefully they fight it out and what is subrogation it? subrogate. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to be waiting there patiently trying to figure out, cause you won't be patient trying to figure out, well, who's going to pay this claim. Good point. But but it, but yeah, there's a, the actuaries have done a whole bunch of math, and there's discounts if you have both your home and the auto with the same company. It often meaning your actual price is going to be cheaper than if you went and found cheap over here and cheap over here. Mm -hmm. And so, Mike, you you gave the example of shopping for whatever your whatever recipe you might be making, and you are a cheapest as is best shopper. When it comes to my uh, spaghetti sauce. When it I comes guess. to sp spaghetti, spaghetti sauce. spaghetti noodles. But I'm looking <laughs> at your uh, mobile phone sitting on the table right now. That's not the cheapest mobile phone you can get. There's a cheaper phone that you could actually get that 
that would do some of the same stuff. And it has a pretty cool flip feature. <laughs> so you're so, totally right, Kevin. You're right. totally right. And you know, when you look at the vehicle that you're driving and the house that you live in, and there's a lot of different things. So the tricky thing about insurance is most people don't have the technical knowledge or technical expertise to be able to effectively shop. So just a quick hot off the presses. Yesterday, uh, we we're meeting with some folks and. Uh, Corhorn Financial Group has an insurance agency. We're able to offer our clients home, uh, auto, commercial, all different types of insurance, life, disability, health, all these things. So the the folks that we were talking to, we said, hey, would you like us to analyze your insurance? And they said, yeah, we, we have a long time relationship with a, a big box insurance company um, and they, they sell only their insurance. And so we kind of would like to give him an opportunity and so we said well okay go ahead and 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 meet with him and and see what you can come up with and they did and they they brought back these proposals to us and said well what do you think about this and I said well I I like these it's just when you this umbrella policy that you should have had for years now is, is finally getting proposed to you the problem with what's pre- being proposed is there's not un insured, underinsured uh, motorists on this policy. How can you shop for this coverage when it's hard to even pronounce those things? Like, I, we don't, like, how, what makes you a qualified consumer to go out and shop if you don't understand? I mean, the insurance world, it's like a different language. Would you say, Josh, subro, subro, <laughs> subrogation? I mean, it's so confusing. So right. how, how can you shop? I, I remember shopping for the first time. Um, I was sit. I can picture myself. I'm sitting in our first apartment, buying my first policy on my own. I'm no longer on my parents' policy. And how did I do it? I, back then, I literally picked up a phone book, if you remember what those were, and I started calling some some agencies, and I was just getting quotes. And the only information that most of them asked me for was what's the VIN number on the car so that they knew what they were insuring. They, they really didn't share with me, educate me or anything on, on what I was doing. And I just went with cheap, mm-hmm. right? And that's kind of the question that we're, we're hitting here. If, if your decision-making process is just shop around until you find something a little bit cheaper, what you may be doing is actually cutting into or eroding the goodness of the policies that you have anyway. You might not even be protecting yourself the way that you should be. And it's part of the reason why we believe that your insurance decisions are a financial planning decision, really. It's, it's at the heart of this is a risk management solution that you're trying to come up with. How do you make sure that you're not exposed to life events that could undo your financial progress just because you had a bad day? And um, it, it's tricky because, you know, if you have the same experience that I did when I was in my apartment just calling people out of the phone book, they may not be actually proposing to you or recommending to you the coverage that you actually need. And instead, we really believe that these decisions should be made in collaboration with your certified financial planner. You know, we, we were talking at one of the breaks, and um, we, we kind of pondered the question, what, what would the world look like if your insurance agent had to behave like a fiduciary, just like your certified financial planner does. A fiduciary, if you remember, that's someone who has to act in your best interest. They need to not just give you good enough, they've got to give you best, right? And a certified financial planner is looking at the big picture and making these insurance recommendations to you um, based on what you're trying to achieve in your life, what your real risks are, and may come up with totally different answers on what your policies should look like compared to that phone book scenario that I lived out. I mean, think, think about that. The, the insurance industry and how you get your insurance would look completely different if it wasn't buyer beware, right? It, and, and so I kind of, I, I, I dream about, wow, what? I hadn't ever thought of that, Josh, until you brought it up or Kevin, until you brought it up. And I thought, wow, what a different world. But the truth is, it doesn't have to be that different from your reality. If you're making your insurance decisions with your certified financial planner and in the context 
of your overall financial plan. I mean, that, that is the best way, the best way to do it. It also creates the context for when you should be making changes as well. Because part of the other question was, well, how often should you shop around? Well, it, it depends on how often your situation is changing. Mm-hmm. Or, or maybe some material changes have happened within the company that you've been, you've been trusting as your insurance provider. Um, but your certified financial planner is the one that is creating context or creating the conversations helping you pay attention to your evolving financial life and your policies, your, your insurance protection, that package should change and grow and evolve right along with the rest of your financial life. So uh, if we boil this down, work with your certified financial planner to figure out what is appropriate overall coverage for your situation. I cannot tell you how many times people come in and they're brand new clients and they're, they're coming in because they have an investment problem or what they think is an investment problem or a retirement problem. And we start looking and their financial life is disintegrated, not disintegrating. That would be a problem, but you should go see a CFP if you've got that going on too. Uh, But it's disintegrated, meaning their insurance is just over here, no man's land. Mm -hmm. The decisions as to how much liability and what do I need is totally disconnected from the rest of their financial life that it's trying to protect. And so, work with your certified financial planner. What coverage do I need? And then work with an independent agent, hopefully in collaboration, to make sure you've got the right company providing that coverage at the best possible price. Yeah, so once you've determined what types of coverage you need, then it makes sense to compare. And that's why you want to work with an independent agent, so that Mm -hmm. they don't have just one company. Because I can promise you this, if if an insurance agent represents just one company, that will be their solution for you. And that's what I love about auto owners, actually. They work with independent agencies, which means they have to be competitive, right? They have to be bringing great solutions to the marketplace. And they're not going to win the business, so to speak, in every situation because there's no one company out there that does it all for everyone. But your, your independent agent has the ability to get you matched up with the right tools, with the right company. All right. That is all the time we have for today. On behalf of Josh Gregory, Kevin Corhorn, myself, and all of us at KFG, have a great weekend. We'll see you next Saturday for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group. Securities offered through Silver Oak Securities, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through KFG Wealth Management, LLC. Doing business as Corhorn Financial Group. KFG Wealth Management, LLC and Silver Oak Securities Incorporated companies are unaffiliated.